Hello, good morning everybody and welcome to our webinar uh, and on COVID-19 What Next. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Paul Gibbons, I am the uh, founding director and chief executive of Decipher Consulting. Uh, the webinar today will consist of four speakers looking at the challenges and some do's and don'ts as we come through COVID-19. We'll be looking at issues as we see them through the lens of a consultant, a barrister, an employer, and a main contractor. At the end of the session, there'll be a panel discussion and we would welcome any questions that you may have. I am very pleased to be joined today with, um, sorry, by Annie Clift um, from Lime Slade. We've asked Annie to moderate this session uh, and hopefully that will go uh, smoothly. I'm also joined uh, by Tom Francis. Tom is a director at Decipher and heads up our program management business. He is an expert in forensic delay analysis and leads a team of planning and delay experts. Tom will be giving a consultant's, pers consultant's perspective on what we should be doing around re record keeping and programs. <coughs> today uh, but with, uh, by Andrew Singer QC, Andrew is a, a Queen's Counsel at, Queen, at King's Chambers, who practices exclusively in the field of construction and associated professional negligence matters. He appears regularly in the TCC and as counsel in construction related arbitrations. He is also an accredited mediator, arbitrator and adjudicator. And he also sits as a part-time judge in the TCC and is a county court recorder. Andrew will be giving a barrister's perspective on COVID-19, what next? We are also joined today by Ayu Alu. Ayu is a Director of Design, Technical and Innovation at Clarion Housing Group. He is also Chair of the Education, Quality Standards and Practice Board within the CIOB. And Ayu will be giving his views on the employer's perspective. And finally, but no means least, I'm joined today with Mark McGreevy. Mark is Chief Operating Officer at CISC. Mark has overall responsibility for a number of businesses in the CISC Group. Mark retains responsibility for the planning and execution of CISC's group-wide commercial strategy. A lot of Mark's time is focused on effective governance and risk assurance. Uh, Mark will be giving his thoughts looking through the lens of the main contractor. I'd like to thank all the speakers for giving up their time this morning. And without further ado, I shall hand over to Annie to moderate the session. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, we're going to take this fairly casually. We're going to kind of have um, an in-discussion chat with all of our speakers. Before we start, I just want to make it clear that nothing here is legal advice. It's all opinions. Um, so we're going to kick off with, with Tom this morning, uh, looking at the consultant's perspective, particularly uh, starting with project programmes. We know that coronavirus is causing disruption, um, sites are closed, those that are open are socially distancing, uh, supply chains are disrupted. How do you think this is going to affect the programmes going forward and what should we be doing to monitor the disruption? So, good morning, Annie, and morning to the panellists. I think um, from a consultant's perspective, we see um, this position of coronavirus from a different perspectives. So we've got some clients who can make contractors, some are subcontractors and ultimate employers. And I've had a number of phone calls over the past uh, week or so in regard to coronavirus and its effect on the programme. It's very weak and employers ask me what records they should be keeping beyond the programme records that the contractor keeps. Similarly, I'll have a, uh, a main contractor has asked, who is about to go into contract on a new piece of work, has asked how do we plot in social distancing across that programme? Obviously, a lot of uncertainty and a lot of issues there. But I think the programme is going to come to the fore um, both in record keeping and in forward planning uh, going forward. I think um, obviously it depends on, on the site, the status of the site. Some sites are shut, some are open, some are working on a more limited basis. I think the impact on the programme um, varies depending on the type of work. I think civils works perhaps more in the open air, uh, able to proceed perhaps um, a bit more readily. But social distancing isn't quite as big an issue as perhaps more traditional building works where a number of trades typically work in more confined areas. Um, I think the key going forward from my perspective is record keeping. And I think the programme plays um, a key point in that. Um, and particularly as I foresee there likely to be quite a significant um, sensitivity in the programmes going forward. And what I mean by that is that you may have had a project proceeding quite well during the construction phase uh, prior to COVID-19. 
suddenly you've got perhaps designers who've been furloughed. We've seen that with some of the large design houses. Does that mean design won't keep pace with the works on site? We, as a consultancy, have also seen, particularly in the Middle East, for some of our clients there, where they've struggled to get materials and people into, um, into, onto their sites from other countries, uh, particularly from Europe. And obviously that will play out in terms of the sensitivity of the critical works on, on the project. Does that mean that the site works no, no longer critical and it moves into the procurement phase or the design phase? So I think the sensitivity of the programme going forward will be, will be key. And I think in that regard, um, it's probably more important than ever to update it on a regular basis. Ideally, if you can, perhaps weekly would be my advice, uh, as a minimum monthly. Um, and also, I think the other key point is, if the site is shut, then you know, under certain forms of contracts, such as NEC, you still have an obligation to update your programme for acceptance on a regular basis. So it's not something we can forget about, it's something we need to continue to do and to, um, you know, to, to, to just keep on board with it, really. Um, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to place a big burden on contractors to, to, to record keep going forward. Um, you know, I think, but I think if you're ever going to do it now, is perhaps the time to, to, to keep putting those measures in place. And you've, you've mentioned there quite a few times how important record keeping is. What types of records do you think people should be focusing on keeping and how do you think they'll be used going um, forward? So we've seen some interesting record keeping um, in this period. We've seen one, one contractor who uh, was about to shut their site and did so a few weeks back. It subsequently reopened. But what they did was a video walk around of the whole of their site. So it was pretty clear to uh, the client or the employer what the status of the works were at that point in time. They've subsequently continued that process with all of their um, applications for payments going forward. So the client can see clearly there's no disagreement over the work that had been achieved on a regular basis. I think that's quite a good idea. I think, um, obviously, we talked about the programme um, in particular. I think if, if you have a claim perhaps for disruption, if your contract allows it, then obviously daily allocation sheets are important. What the workforce are doing, where they're working, uh, what's been achieved, what hasn't been achieved. I think traditionally this is an, L an area which contractors pay a bit of lip service to. You may record what, the, what people are on site, but not what they're doing. I think that type of record is, is crucial um, so that you hopefully can avoid a dispute and can settle things amicably once we get through the, this, this period of, of difficulty. And I think the key point is obviously going forward is how do you record a lack of productivity as a result of social distancing? You know, how does that play out? It's going to be, it's going to be huge on certain projects. Um, productivity is going to flew, fall through the floor, I would imagine, for certain trades, perhaps not all, but certain trades will be significantly affected. And I think it's just prudent to keep in place good records of what's occurred so that you, like I say, you can hopefully, you know, like, like essentially negotiate um, a successful outcome with your contracting party at the end of this. Thanks, Tom. Mark, I'm going to come to you. What practical steps are you taking on sites that are still open? The kind of practical steps we're taking in relation to what Tom has said is, um, obviously, we, we uh, are using technology as much as possible to keep those records that Tom says are so important because it's, it's those records that we're going to use to obviously feed into updating the programmes uh, to understand the impact. Uh, and the way we're capturing those records now via technology is there, obviously we, you know, you the usual um, uh, photographic records that's been kept. We now have live webcams, and a lot of projects uh, use them. Uh, you have drone footage being used, and indeed uh, laser scanning is becoming more and more prevalent in terms of way of, of recording progress on site. So there, that's how technology is, is coming into play. Um, of the other uh, thing we're doing is um, more frequent measures of what's been done on site. So we would have, um, you'll see the, the surveyors and the, the frontline team recording the output each week. Uh, now, they, they wouldn't maybe have done that as frequently in the past. Um, and that's to understand what is the, the, the level of productivity we're now getting. And that's important, obviously, as part of that record keeping process. But it's also really important because um, it's, uh, there's a point at which productivity was dropping on some sites where it was becoming uh, a borderline whether it made any sense to keep the site open uh, or not. And it was just going to cost more money to try and deliver the project. Uh, at the end of the day, that, that, that became a big, a big decision piece. So 
Um, hence the, the reason for the importance of, of keeping those uh, weekly productivity measures, you know, so um, they're the practical steps. Thanks, Mark. Io, what do you expect from a, as a client and what are you doing to support the contractors you're working with? Um, it's been an interesting stress test, I think, the, uh, the whole shutdown. And from a client's perspective, I think the, there are two things we can do, micro level and, and macro level. I say at a micro level, the first thing would be for both consultants and contractors to, to kind of make sure we support them with any existing obligations that we've, that we've undertaken. And that means just not downing tools or not sort of calling a stop to any works or, you know, especially during sort of pre-construction periods where there's a lot of heavy consultant involvement and still a lot of heavy contractor involvement to reach a goal. And um, it's very easy for cold feet to um, occur at that point in time and people to shut down and say they're not going to continue projects until we get some clarity over when things will start up again. I think if investments have been made and have been budgeted for and a company as an employer is able to take that, um, not on the chin, but to take that stress that they should you know, meet those obligations to the consultants and contractors and allow them to at least finish things to a reasonable stage. So, so I think that's probably the first and most important thing we can do um, consultants do tend to live, you know, purely based on their cash flow. And I think coming out of this, it'll be interesting to see how many consultants and contractors take a real hard look at their reserve policy and, and how they sort of, you know, put money away for rainy days or instances where things could just shut down so suddenly as, as they have this time. So I think that's what could be done on a micro level from, from an employer's perspective, just to support that, that sort of way of thinking. On a macro level, now is really the time for employers to think as strategically as they possibly can. And I'm talking about forming partnerships, you know, looking at joint ventures with other companies of a similar ilk and maybe talking to contractors who are going to need a real quick start coming out of the shutdown and, and thinking about how we can plan and, you know, get things through planning or get projects into feasibility so we can really make a concerted start on, on the other side of it. So I think, I think the time can be spent wisely um, in planning. I think the, the support can be given through sticking to original commitments. And I think that sort of future looking ahead as to what happens on the other side of this is probably the most critical thing about how companies, small and large, will, will behave during this period. Thank you. Andrew, I'm going to come to you. We're going to have a little look at disputes and avoiding them. What do you think are the main risks for those still operating sites at the moment? Okay, well, I mean, Obviously, um, there's a huge health and safety risk around operating sites. I mean, it's, as I'm sure everyone who's watching knows, construction work hasn't been banned by the um, legislation. And um, indeed, there's becoming a little bit perhaps of an effort on the part of the government, certain governments, to, to, to get construction work kick-started or restarted. So there's no, there's no bar on, on construction work. Um, and, but there is obviously a bar on people working too close to each other, um, social, social distancing, as we, as we now call it. Um, so there's obviously a massive health and safety issue that has to be addressed. And, and the, the other panellists have already talked about those sorts of practical issues and the different sort of sites you might be on and somewhere there's just not the room. And therefore, that bag by virtue of not being able to keep people far enough away, you either have to pay little work or, as Mark says at the stage, is no, no work at all. So that's obviously a massive risk. The other risks um, are obviously the, the, all, the risks that all parties have in construction projects, which is money and time. So the, the, there's a massive, there's a, obviously an issue of whether um, the COVID situation, when it arose and as it progresses um, amounts to what lawyers call force majeure which is a um, actually not an English legal concept at all it's a French civil legal concept but, but it basically means a, a, something that nobody uh, appreciated and no one has any any outside control over sometimes people sometimes call it act of God that, that kind of thing so in a project that started well before COVID was even heard of, and that will obviously be a large number of projects. 
that the, the issue arises to whether what has now happened, if it causes loss on site or delay on site, uh, amounts to force majeure. And then the, the next issue, and it probably does, and then the next issue is whether that is something which allows a contractor to make a claim or a subcontractor. Uh, and uh, as far as that's concerned, uh, in the JCT contract, unamended, force majeure is, is, a, is a delaying event, but it doesn't give rise to any, any claim for money of itself. Uh, in the NEC type of contract, force majeure is not defined uh, in, in terms, but that the relevant compensation event, which is defined and is widely believed to be a force majeure clause, gives time and money. So um, obviously there's a risk there that for contractors and for employers. I just want to echo what everybody else has said about records. The, what, the one thing that you need to have as a, as a lawyer, either bringing a claim or defending a claim is, is, is good records. Judges, arbitrators, adjudicators, anyone in making a decision, they absolutely love contemporary records much more than they believe or give much store to anything that anybody says happened. When you think about it, nine months, 12 months, 15, 18 months down the line, somebody's trying to remember what happened on site, what somebody said to them in a meeting. If that's written down, preferably signed by everyone as a notice, um, then uh, this question just come in. I don't want to deal with that now. But we'll take the questions uh, at the end. We'll okay. Um, so records are absolutely vital. The other thing that's very important is that even though obviously the way forward is, as everybody says, cooperation, uh, nevertheless, don't, don't forget to use the contract mechanisms if you can. So if you're making a claim for extra time or extra money, put the notice in on time. If you're an employer and somebody's made a big claim for money that they, you think is totally invalid, don't forget to put a pay less notice in because otherwise you could end up on the wrong side of a so-called smash and grab adjudication, paying out a lot of money. And at the moment, the last thing anybody wants to be doing is paying extra money. So, so those are you know, the, the, main, the main risks as I, as, as I see them, money, time, and of course, health and safety. And are you seeing many disputes arising at the moment? And what types do you, will you see coming forward in the next few months, years? Uh, well, um, me, me personally, I haven't yet, but we're only a few weeks into the, um, the lockdown. I haven't yet had any specifically COVID-related um, litigation. But um, I think it's inevitable that there will be a recession if there isn't one already. Yeah. And in recessions, people run out of money and people have less, in, less keenness to pay money out. So I would have thought it's inevitable that there will be um, less payments made than should have been made. And there will therefore be more adjudications to start with. There'll be people who exploit the lack of a pay less notice and there'll be people who, who serve pay less notices with made up grounds in them just to avoid making payments. So I, I see the first instance there's going to be disputes about payment. I think it's possible also there may be disputes about access to site and um, perhaps a rise in what we haven't seen for quite a long time. Injunctions, either people trying to get back on site or people trying to get at contractors or subcontractors off the site. It largely depends on how bad the situation becomes, on how stretched the economy becomes. But that's the sort of thing that we would expect. Um, and going back to your point on force majeure, uh, as the government has said construction can continue, do you think force majeure claims would be successful? Well, what, what, there's a difference between the government issuing a, a, an act which makes something unlawful. That's not force majeure. That's normally treated differently under all the main forms of building contract. But what might be force majeure is that because of COVID, for example, you can't get your supplies into the country and therefore you can't do the work because 
critical part of the word, steel, glass, whatever it is. It just isn't a plaster. It just isn't arriving and you haven't got any. That might be force majeure. The fact that your subcontractors um, stop being able to work on site or, or go into liquidation might also be sort of seem to be force majeure. I don't think there's any doubt that COVID is like is very likely to be seen as a force majeure event. But um, certainly for for jobs that started in advance, unlikely to be now because everybody knows about it. Okay. Uh, looking uh, look into the future, we're starting to see um, contracts that have got COVID clauses in them. Yeah. So what about for those entering new contracts? Have you got any advice on what they should well, look out for? Well, I, I mean, that, that's the point that everybody is going to have a COVID clause. And um, I mean, Mark may will probably know more about this than me because he'll be entering into new contracts all the time. But there's no, and it may also be that clause, COVID clauses are being inserted into contracts that have only just started. You know, if you've got a contract, if you've got a project that's running for, for years rather than months, you're going to have to deal with that. Um, as an ongoing situation. So um, certainly clients, um, employers and their advisors will be astute to start putting COVID clauses in, perhaps putting Z clauses in the NEC to make it clear that actually you don't get money for a COVID event as opposed to any other form of force majeure. Um, the JCT, again, clients ordinarily will amend the JCT. Um, very, very, very unusual to see people entering into a, a project of any size with an unamended standard form of contract. Um, so that's what people need to look out for. They need to look out for how the, the, the ordinary understood risk pre-COVID was being switched by amendments to, to the basic forms of contract that people enter into. Okay. Mark, is that similar to what you're seeing for new contracts? Absolutely, yes. Um, all new contracts that we'll be seeking, the industry will be seeking to, to get provisions inserted to deal with this particular issue. It's going to be tricky because um, COVID will get resolved, but will there be another version of COVID uh, in, the, in the near future after that again? Is this going to become more frequent? And uh, how, will the, how will that be defined in the contract? going to be a real challenge. Um, also, uh, from the point of view of um, change in legislation, the, there could be changes in legislation happening over the next couple of years as a result of this COVID uh, pandemic. And again, how will that be considered foreseen or unforeseen in contracts? That's going to be a challenge too, going forward. So there's a few, few things there for us to, to figure out with our clients, yeah. yeah. And Aya, taking the client's perspective, what are the changes you've made and, and what do you see being the big changes for the future? So it's direct changes that we've made um, once the, the impact of um, the impact of COVID started to become clear was the need to adjust all manner of expectations. That's everything, everything from delivery to sales to demand. Um, I think there are good legislative standards that keep the quality of, of products um, sort of uh, standard. But what, what we also had to do, and what, what I'm doing now, is actually thinking a little bit more about the product that we provide and how it could account for something like this happening in the future. You take an example of um, outdoor space in apartments and the need for people to be able to just maintain their sanity by having access to an outdoor space. But there are many of them, many outdoor spaces now, which have no balcony and have limited external area. And, and that's really something we've got to start thinking about um, going forwards. Because should this happen again, I don't think anybody could be, could be sort, of, um, could sort of hand on heart say that they did that in good faith, knowing that people are actually suffering in, in apartments without um, external space at the moment. So that's, that's the kind of thing we've got to think about going forward um, as an adjustment to our, our, current, our current stance. We're also thinking about accounting for working from home scenarios. So you think about a typical apartment and how you might lay out, or a house, and how you might lay out your, um, your units and your, your sockets and that sort of thing. 
you now should probably start thinking about how you would um, facilitate a working from home scenario over a longer period of, of time. You know, so maybe you do have a bank of sockets or something um, in a particular area which facilitates a home working scenario. And, and these are all just, you know, obvious little tricks that once you start looking at what the core needs of an individual are in this sort of scenario, they really, they float to the surface quite quickly. So I, I'd, I'd say we're, you know, on a macro level, again, we're, we're adjusting our sales projections, we're adjusting things like our delivery dates, and that's hand in hand with our contracting partners. Naturally, you'd expect that. But at a micro level, again, we are looking at how our product adjusts to meet this kind of challenge in the future and, and focusing a lot more on community design and designing for health and well-being. And that, that for us is a key thing in, um, in being able to withstand, you know, another sort of four or five month period of isolation. Okay. Yeah, I think that's true. Everyone's going to be looking at the way they live and, and how their homes are set up very differently. Um, ongoing projects are continuing, but do you think we'll see delays to the starts of new projects? Will that be a major impact? I think that remains to be seen, and that's going to tie in very closely with how the recession um, is, is sort of perceived, the impact of the recession is perceived. I think we can realistically say that such a shock to an economy is going to result in a period of stagnation and a period of sort of slowed growth afterwards. Um, it's largely dependent on the government's recovery strategy, which, which is being monitored closely. I mean, the construction minister is supportive of um, reopening sites and wider industry are supportive too. I guess you just need, need to have a little bit of caution around the health and safety um, aspect, especially with minimizing risk to operatives and, and that, is going to be at the forefront of any decision to open any site quickly because you know we, we live in a society where we, we must have a full consideration for all persons this is not a, a sort of situation where we could say well construction could go uh, you know go ahead um without considering the absolute health and safety of its operatives on site as a priority we're not in that sort of society and so i think that will trickle back up the up the line and that will essentially govern how quickly we can get back to work. Um, and, and that has a, a knock-on effect because if contracts take longer, then the development of them takes longer, the cost of them increases, and all these things have a, a sort of ripple effect going back up the chain. But I think that needs to be worked out very, very carefully. Um, so industry partners have delayed some of their projects, just basically adjusting their delivery dates to some of the emerging economic assumptions on when the economy is actually going to come back in. But fundamentally, when you're working with housing, it's all about the demand and, and the demand for that housing in a particular area. And that's what your target always, always looks at. What, which tenure, which typology goes best for that particular area of the country. And so that, there's gonna be a, a very detailed exercise happening, which you know, takes a very risk adverse view to that going forward in any sort of recession. Yeah. And do you think the types of projects we see um, beginning to start will change? Maybe less office buildings, um, things like that. I, th I do. I do think so. I think you know, with a with a, an economic recession comes, as someone said earlier, the need for people to keep their money close to their to their chest and and to sort of batten down the hatches. Um, I, I think we're going to see a, an emergence of. What, what I call the sort of biblical needs, if you like, the sort of education, the, the, the healthcare, um, and the shelter. And that's basically looking for housing to meet needs, making sure that healthcare is robust enough to not only meet local needs, but to withstand um, future shocks to the healthcare system as the one we've had. I think there's, it's, it's, uh, it's not up for any debate that we have, well, we could have been a lot better prepared for this. Um, and I think that we need to just make sure that going forward, those are the priority projects that, that, are, that are worked on. And I think that will happen. I think there's enough sort of, um, sort of people power at the moment that's, that's floating around to make sure that the government and, and, uh, and large scale employers focus on meeting the needs of communities. So I think that that's, that's something that's gonna see, that we're gonna see coming forward in the next uh, few months. Brilliant. And Mark, coming back to you, in terms of the government response, um, do we think that in the long term we'll get a lot of support from the government for the construction sector? 
Yeah, uh, in, in fairness, it's been a, a challenge from a government point of view uh, on a couple of fronts. I, I think given the, the size and, and, and of this particular challenge, the nature of it, um, initially governments, governments across Europe, certainly any of the countries that we are working in, working in Ireland, uh, UK and various countries in mainland Europe, and we've seen uh, probably the, the, the common uh, reaction was an element of uh, confusion and lack of clarity as to what, what supports industry needed, even in terms of direction as to what sites could open and not open and, and, and operate. Once we got over that and government realized that, they, uh, that a construction industry was such a key player in terms of the, the GDP in any particular country, they realized that they had to provide uh, some uh, greater clarity and some form of support. And we started seeing that implemented in different ways, I suppose. Um, we, uh, most of the countries where construction has had to stop, you've seen the government put in uh, payment support plans for the industry, which has been seen as very positive. Um, they've been put in in different ways, which is added to the challenge um, uh, in terms of implementing them with our own people. But, um, but they're there nonetheless, which is fantastic. Uh, contractually, really interesting um, in Ireland here where we've got a very, um, we've, we've got a very one-sided contract with the government and all public infrastructure works um, and uh, where the, most of the risk is passed down to the contractors and, and ultimately the supply chain. And uh, the government has uh, realized the need to step up uh, to the plate on this particular event and share the pain. So that whilst the contract uh, may not have given support to the industry in terms of the cost and time impact of this, uh, they are now saying that absolutely you'll get your time and there will also be an ex gratia payment towards the cost of it, which was uh, very much welcomed by the industry. Um, and uh, however, it's, it's time constrained um, and we are still no, none the wiser as to how long this lockdown will continue in Ireland uh, and therefore how much of uh, support we'll get ultimately because obviously it's a huge burden on the exchequer in each country uh, because of the effect of all of this. But on the whole, we've got to see reasonable government support. Brilliant. And um, we talked a little bit earlier about the types of records you're keeping on sites that are still open, but what about the other practical steps that are happening? Many of us have been at home um, this whole time, but what's going on on site? Yeah, look, the, the practical steps, uh, from, mostly from a health and safety point of view initially, because that's, that's the most important priority is keeping people safe and well uh, on our sites. So we immediately started to put in those uh, measures to ensure people were kept safe and, and um, avoided the impact of uh, catching the virus. Uh, so measures were put in place um, uh, in, in differing ways across, across our projects until um, we started to realise what was working and what, what wasn't working. Um, we have the benefit, I suppose, for the, by virtue of the fact we are working in different jurisdictions. So we have had the health and safety authorities in those different jurisdictions requiring different measures. So we've had to get our heads around that. But for the most part, broadly, the measures are similar. Broadly, the measures uh, have been put in place reasonably easily. Um, it's taken some time, obviously. It's taken time for the personnel on sites to get used to the new measures. But once they were in place, people started getting used to them. And uh, we have a number of sites uh, across Europe and obviously across the UK, which are all still operational. And it has become the new norm, I suppose. Um, and that's everything from dealing with how people come to work, uh, how people eat part of work, how people get onto site, how people go to work on the code face. We've had to risk assess all, all the task um, uh, orientated method statements to make sure they're, they're appropriate and uh, put in physical measures to deal with those issues. That's all working. The other thing I suppose from a business point of view is we have had to uh, obviously have a detailed review of our, um, our forecasts on, on the business. People mentioned on a couple of occasions already the importance of, of managing your cash. Your cash. Um, so uh, that meant uh, doing detailed reforecasts based on what we think might happen or do an awful lot of scenario planning for different situations. So uh, we've done a lot of that. Um, so we can, be, we can prepare for the impact of this longer term on the business. 
uh, and indeed then we've had to look at their supply chain and the supply chain is so so important in all of these projects uh, right down to where product is coming from because product is now getting held up in ports across the world um, so that's becoming a real challenge and will be a challenge going forward for us so um, so generally on the whole we are um, doing well in terms of implementing new measures but we have a number of challenges ahead of us it's fair to say. In terms of numbers, how many of your sites are operating and is there a difference between the types of sites that you're able to keep open compared to those you, you need to close? Um, virtually all of our sites across UK and Europe and mainland Europe are open. Um, it's Ireland is probably the exception where the government uh, deemed certain projects essential and others non-essential. So in Ireland, uh, essential projects are, are typically anything that has a, uh, is needed from a health and safety point of view um, uh, in terms of putting in COVID-related measures uh, at hospitals or other facilities, uh, testing centres. Um, then you've got the pharma-related projects that are ongoing, which is obviously going to provide much needed either um, medicines or PPE gear uh, for, for the industry. And, um, and then you have the uh, social housing was another exceptional uh, area um, because of the need for housing and to get people out of um, hubs where there were uh, homeless people uh, congregating and the virus was spreading. So the, there was an urgent need to get um, new social housing completed to relieve the pressure in those situations. So they're the kind of um, projects where uh, the exceptions have been um, put in place in Ireland particularly, but I say generally across the rest of the business, most projects are open. Okay. And as uh, people keep calling this situation kind of the new normal and saying, when, you know, we're not going to go back to normal anytime soon. What are your plans for the future and for dealing with that staggered going back to work and reopening of sites more broadly? Yeah, so we're having to put a lot of thought into, you know, how we go to work now in this new situation. It's obviously going to be different uh, for us. Um, we see technology playing a, a huge role in that. Look, look at how we're, we're holding this, this forum now. This is becoming the norm now. Um, it's interesting. We are seeing ourselves um, do site visits and site tours now virtually where uh, people on site are going around, walking around with cameras and recording what's going on and have people connected in to those walk arounds where they're asking questions of those people uh, remotely from remote places and, and, and doing those uh, site visits. Uh, so that's really, really interesting thing. You're going to see an awful lot more of that. Um, I think uh, commercially you're going to see a big change because the prelims, orient, uh, uh, prelims associated with any project are going to change considerably now, uh, certainly in the short to medium term because more, more facilities are going to need it on projects. Um, there'll be more people potentially needed on projects to deal with the reduced productivity. Um, and all of that's going to add to the cost to and to the time effect on these projects. So... Um, that's going to make potentially new projects unviable. So that's going to be a challenge we're going to have to deal with. And something the industry is going to have to start looking at how it can take out cost uh, on projects going forward and, and make them leaner uh, so that it can um, facilitate new projects coming on stream and, and play its role in all of that. And again, as I mentioned a couple of times, technology uh, the, the industry is going to have to innovate and use technology to, to, to help mitigate that. And in terms of the key considerations, what do you think is the most important thing right now for those working on site? Yeah, look, uh, health and safety and, and of our people is obviously uh, the, our primary concern uh, for our clients, ourselves, all stakeholders, our supply chain. Um, so, so that goes without saying. Um, recording the effects right now of this uh, of this on any projects is really really important and, and Tom mentioned that uh, already um, and, and Andrew from a legal perspective the importance of that what was reinforced um, we need to um, 
uh, we need to quickly understand the contractual implications on this on, on every project. We've spent a lot of time doing that right across the whole board, uh, revisiting all contracts to, to, to understand what are the provisions that, that are related to this, because uh, every, every contract is somewhat different. Uh, so that's an important thing for every business to do now. Um, and that's not just upstream, but it's also downstream with the, the supply chain. Um, and make sure then that we're following the contractual terms of those contracts properly. So proper notices going in and then uh, making sure we're collating records in a way that, that would help substantiate those notices and the claims in due course. Really, so that's really, really important now at the minute too. Um, and then, uh, look, I'd say the other thing that's really important is good communication with all of your stakeholders. And uh, there's no point in anybody sitting in a silo right now trying to deal with their own concerns um, without engaging uh, properly, as I say, with either the clients or the supply chain to find out the, the best solution that would mitigate costs and get these jobs going and finished uh, that are underway at the minute. And indeed, look uh, at new projects and making sure they become feasible as well. So conversations, good, good communications is vital now at this stage. And coming back to you, Tom, um, after all, everything we've sort of talked about already today, do you think the, the advice you're giving about record keeping and program, is it practical? Is it, is it able to be done as sites are operating now? Um, well, I think, firstly, I've got quite a lot of sympathy with contractors in terms of record keeping because most contractors just want to get it built. That's the primary aim. Um, margins are slim. You know, um, allocating resource to record keeping in the outset is something you know, perhaps employers wouldn't really want um, but I think it is it is important I'm taking the point that Andrew said and it's my experience um, in particular with adjudication is adjudicators take a very strict approach to um, you know claims you've got to prove it as Andrew said on the contemporaneous information much more so than just witnesses of fact and the, you know the evidence that they give so it is crucial um, it's uh, much more crucial in this the stage we're in at the moment because of the ongoing nature of this this issue social distancing is going to have a huge impact i believe going forward um so yes it comes with a cost um is it practical i believe so um you know what's the alternative to not you know if you want to hopefully negotiate at the end of this um an amicable settlement with your with the party you're in contract with then you're going to have to prove you know what occurred um, in some way um so yeah, yes it's crucial in that regard and Andrew, what are the, the major concerns from a legal perspective? Um, in terms of ongoing work, you mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, um, <clears throat> the major concerns for, <laughs> for everybody in the project are, are, are going to be being paid, continue to being paid. So the, the, the major legal issues, as I indicated already, are going to be um, if you're someone who's likely to be making a claim, making sure that you've got your records, you've put in the relevant notices. And if you're someone who's likely to be on the end of a claim, putting in the, the notices, either payment notices, just answer a question somebody raised off online, uh, or, or pay less notices uh, or the like, considering also issues about progress. Like somebody asked a question about whether if, if there's people not, who are either on site or not on site and working very slowly, whether they're at, issues around making generally making progress or not and, and time is being wasted that way so the 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 main issues that that arise in the covid crisis are the same issues that arise in construction contracts pre or during dispute all the time you know time and time and money the problem with the real issue with covid is it's, it's exaggerated all of those issues so massively because A, it's had a huge effect on the whole of the population of the world. So the supply chain, all the way through the delivery chain, all the way through to the employees, to the clients, to the purchase, the customers. So it's brought everything into massive start, start relief. Um, I, I was just interested because everyone's talk, talking, um, as we often do, um, at a theoretical level about cooperation between the team. And, and it does remind me that um, the adjudication grew out of an original project in the early 90s um, about called building the team. And it was all about how the construction industry was going to become more of a cooperative 
project and the ultimate a end of building the team uh, was the Latham, the Latham report was adjudication, which was in fact just another means of um, dispute resolution. And uh, the, the great, so, <laughs> I mean, obviously the holy grail in, in, in construction is, is cooperation. If you've got a cooperative team and everybody wants to do the same thing, it really doesn't matter what the contract says, it's irrelevant. You have the worst contracts in the world or the best contracts in the world. People are moving forward. It doesn't matter. And if you've got someone who doesn't want to play play ball or someone who doesn't who, who has a different agenda to everyone else on the team, then again it doesn't actually matter what the contract says, because people will, will find a reason to cause to cause trouble to, to make a claim or to, to get rid of someone on the, on the site that they don't want to be there anymore for whatever reason. So obviously cooperation is key. And if you are I'm going to sound strange to say this as a lawyer, but the most important thing at the moment is dispute avoidance, in my view. Because the last thing people need in a, in a crisis like this is to be going to people like me, spending the money they haven't got, suing other people who probably haven't got the money, <laughs> for, for issues that really, if you just sat down and gave a little, little bit of give and take, would go away and people can move on, get the project built out, get the, you know, hopefully the profits to the right places, people in their homes, people in the offices, warehouses, what have you. So, I mean, I think the real key at the moment is to be astute. Probably project managers have got a really, employers, agents have got a really big role now in making sure things just get sorted, sorted out. Um, and I think that's really, really good advice there. Uh, Mark, come back to you on the question of manpower. We've staff furloughed and lots of people unwell and having to self-isolate for periods of time and this could continue um you know at least for the rest of the year or so or even further do we have the manpower to continue projects yes i, I believe we will have the manpower i think there are going to be pockets of challenges in in, in places uh i think some projects will struggle uh, at, at points in time as uh, until we're out the far side of this this um uh, pandemic until we we get a final solution to to the issue um uh, because there will be outbreaks um there's also the risk you know of it um uh, the risk of cases rising again and uh, that's obviously a real concern i suppose where we will see it in the short term uh manpower being an issue is um because some of our subcontracts are relying on labor and resources coming from abroad particularly specialist subcontracts uh, and right now those people are uh, restricted in terms of their ability to travel uh, and we're seeing that becoming a problem on a number of projects and a concern as to when uh, they will be able to remobilize and those trades actually start up on site again. And a as a consequence of that, I think going forward, you'll see a, a push towards trying to uh, find those resources more locally uh, instead of um, seeking that, that skill base from abroad. So that'll be a change I think we'll, we'll see down the line. Thanks. And Paul, to bring you back into the discussion, um, with, you know, a lot of the things we're talking about are going to have big impacts on productivity. Is there anything anyone can be doing to mitigate against those effects? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, Mark's already mentioned there about the uh, insufficient labour pool and the, and the challenges of getting specialists across the water in terms of meeting uh, the, the, the demands of projects. But certainly, uh, you know, COVID will have a massive impact, impact on productivity. And this is going to be caused potentially by uh, people self-isolating, um, possibly issues around uh, enhanced health and safety measures, what the impact that's going to have uh, on people's ability to, to be productive. We're working on projects in the Middle East where they have labour camps and we're aware of situations where some of the labour force have got COVID-19 and so those labour camps have been shut down and therefore those projects themselves are in delay. Um, there potentially is going to be a massive shortage of PPE. We've seen it in the press in terms of PPE for the NHS. What impact is that going to have on PPE for the construction and health, uh, health and safety side of that? The, we've already touched upon the supply chain uh, and potential insolvencies that may be happening. So I think that needs to be shored up because at the end of the day, the specialists in that market that are helping the main contractors to deliver these major schemes. We've already mentioned material supply as well. You know, where's the material coming into? Is it coming in by uh, rail, air, you know, and, and the like? I think this will all lead to, to major issues around productivity. 
what could we do? Um, well, we could extend working hours. Uh, we could look at double shifting. Um, but I think we've got to be careful around that because is that class as mitigation, i.e. was the project in delay prior to COVID-19? Or is it classed as acceleration measures, i.e. to win back uh, lost time as a result of COVID-19? I think those items need to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. And if you've got a, a, an open and willing employer and a, and a cooperative contractor, I think there's got to be a kind of approach to getting uh, you know, a realistic review on what the programme looks like going forward and realigning that programme. Mark's already mentioned the fact that, particularly on site, there's going to be a requirement for more welfare facilities. This is going to have a massive impact on prelims in terms of what was the job priced at previously, in terms of what does it look like now going forward, and are those, and are those recoverable costs. And in addition to that, also more social distancing costs uh, that are going to be incorporated. You may also have situations where um, planned summer work may well be pushed into winter working, and this will also lead to lost productivity. So there's going to be issues around um, the live projects. And indeed, I also see issues around projects that are being tendered. You know, we need to potentially look at the norms that were being used in some of those uh, productivity rates around uh, programmes. No one's got a COVID-19 labour norm, but we're, we're going to be able to get some data, I guess, over the coming months to, to, to look at that. We obviously talked about look, looking at the contracts and putting in COVID-19 clauses. Is that fair and equitable? What does that look like? But I think generally, my message would be um, we need to look at, look at the risk allocation on projects in, in a collective view. We've got to ensure the notices are, are, are obviously issued and we've got to maintain the records that record all of the effects of COVID-19. So that would be my, my initial response to that. Thanks. And Aya, you touched upon earlier the recession uh, being, a, being a risk we could look at. Do you think this could be a long-term risk? And what do you think the response from the industry might be? Um, I, I do think it could be a long-term risk. I think that we were, we were teetering, if you like, um, coming out of a few of the most recent political decisions and, and looking at the future of the country economically. We were always, there's always a bit of uncertainty. And I think this has just pushed us into a place where um, we're now being forced to, to reset our strategic thinking a, as a country. So in terms of the industry, um, I think the challenges remain constant. I think the, the sort of uh, land acquisition, getting through planning, establishing a demand, um, and, and the development of schemes is always going to be a, a constant pressure, albeit heightened. Um, the economic pressure now really squeezes the demand pool, and that's, that's going to be... That's going to be one of the, the core things. So the ability for people to spend, to buy or to rent or to do whatever they want to do in terms of infrastructure and real estate, if that's squeezed, as we all know, that ripples right the way back up the um, right the way back up the other uh, spectrum. So I think that uh, the challenges are still there, but the solutions, as mentioned, are about joint ventures. And this is not from a collaborative, you know, gentleman's handshake, a gentleman's agreement sort of um, perspective, but true joint ventures between private and public partners to get the industry moving again. I think if we, if we start talking to investors seriously about the potential that there is in our industry and the ability to realise that potential, um, bringing in the new technology, bringing in new ways of working, looking at the new products that that we need to feed the, the sort of consumerism that we have in this country. I think there's a massive, massive opportunity, um, but it does, it does require joint ventures from top to bottom. So I think um, contractors and developers should certainly look at more closer working relationships and, you know, almost on a, on a sort of long-term basis, not just one project, think about it over a 10 or a 15 year period, that sort of thing. I'd, I'd recommend that as a starting point. Um, and I, I think that the, there are other opportunities that are going to spring out of um, a potential, if you like, a recession or, or a shortage of, of uh, labour coming into this country as well. We're, we're going to have the opportunity to sort of reset skills, I think, as a country. And, and this is all based on government strategy and, and what the government really wants to set out. Um, that there are, there are opportunities to, to sort of retrain people at ground level, to bring them into the industry, to sort of boost our own GDP um, internally as a country. Um, and that will really help us in a, in a recession. 
I, I've, all, I've always thought the recession is a, it's a dangerous time because money's short, but it's almost the best time to plan for a long-term solution to it. And if we can get out of the habit of having a, a sort of boom and bust approach to our industry, establish a pipeline, establish infrastructure planning, and establish skills training on a long-term basis, completely a political basis, then, then I think we'll, we'll start to see some real results. But that, that's the challenge. It's the strategic thinking and the planning that comes with being in a recession and thinking about how you can get out of it and avoid it again. I think that that's where we, we need to sort of put our efforts into. Okay. And Mark, do you think we learn any lessons from the last recession? Do you think we're better prepared this time around? Certainly hope we have learned uh, some good lessons from the, from the last recession. Um, uh, things that come, probably three things that come to mind uh, in that respect, Andy, are um, uh, in terms of people. Uh, we, we stopped investing in people and training people, recruiting uh, graduates into the industry, and that caused a long-term problem for the industry. It was harder for us to get back up on our feet again um, and to this day, we're, we're suffering as an industry because we don't have enough um, of a talent pool in the industry coming through from the universities. It's only really now starting to, to, um, to get back to some sort of normal. So I think we've got to um, keep supporting that, uh, making sure that there is a pipeline of new talent coming into the business and keep training our people. Uh, and that's, a, that's both white collar and blue collar as well. Um, technology, in the last recession, um, when we went into it, we stopped uh, investing in innovation and technology. And again, that caused us longer term problems uh, when um, the market started to improve. So I think uh, it'll be important that we retain a focus on that. Um, that is, we've got, uh, the industry is starting to see how it's become uh, better able to embrace technology. And it's got to um, stick with that going forward uh, and keep investing in it. And then the final thing was probably the importance of uh, the capital investment programs being ruled out by the government. Uh, again, government stopped spending in the last recession. And as a result of that, uh, we are suffering even to this day because of a lack of investment in the social infrastructure. Uh, both in the UK and, and in Ireland and then elsewhere. So it's important that the, the government doesn't do that again. It, it needs to keep investing in that infrastructure. It needs to, uh, in, now is the time when money is as cheap as it'll ever will be to use that uh, cheap money to invest in that infrastructure and get jobs shovel ready and to take the, the um, peaks and troughs, trying to eliminate some of those steep peaks and troughs that come in from, from a recessionary period. Uh, so there are three things I think are really, really important. I think that's pretty much all we've got time for today. Thank you all for joining us and thank you to all our speakers for being here. Paul, do you want to say anything yes, before absolutely. we go? I want to thank you all for attending the seminar and I uh, hope you've all found it very, very useful. I'd like to thank the speakers. So, Andrew, thank you very much for your time. Mark, thank you for your time. Ayu, thank you for your time and contribution. And Tom, thank you for your time. And Annie, thank you very much for moderating. I wish you all a very uh, good day and safe and well. Thank you.